Nice. Boy, it's good to be able to see in the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's all stand up this morning. Serve the Lord with gladness in our works and work. Sing that. Serve the Lord with gladness in our works and ways. Serve him with gladness Enter his horse with song To our creator To praise his belong Great is his mercy Wonderful is his name We gladly serve him His great love proclaim See what happens? We're going to retard that just a little bit at, at, at the end, okay? <coughs> Fun times. Let's pick it up here. All right, sorry about that. We'll go, we're, we're going to start over, but we'll do the second verse, okay? We'll serve the Lord with gladness, thankful all the while. Sing it, serve him with gladness. We'll serve him with gladness. Enter his courts of song to our creator. True praise we long. Great is his mercy. Wonderful is his name. We gladly serve him. His great love proclaim. Sing that last verse. And serve the Lord with gladness. This shall be our theme. As we walk together in his love supreme. Listening, ever listening for the still small voice. His sweet will so precious will be our choice. Serve him with gladness. To our Creator, true praises belong. Great is His mercy, wonderful is His name. We gladly serve Him. His great love proclaim. Amen. Y'all can be seated this morning. Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Are you ready for him to return? Amen. Amen. Well, Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Coming in power and love to reign. What if it were today? Coming to claim this chosen bride. All the redeemed and purified. Over this whole earth scattered wide. What if it were today? Glory, glory, joy to my heart will bring. Glory, 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 haste to prepare the way. Glory, glory, Jesus. Jesus will come someday. Let's sing that second verse. Satan's, Satan's dominion will then be home. What if it were today? Sorrow and signs shall be no more. What if it were today? Then shall the dead in Christ arise. It's caught up to me in the skies. When shall these glories be? What if it were today? Glory, glory, joy to my heart will bring. Glory, glory, haste to prepare me. Glory, glory, haste 
to prepare the way. Glory, glory, Jesus will come someday. Let's sing that last verse. Faithful and true would he find us here if he should come today. Watching in gladness and not in fear if he should come today. Signs of his coming multiply. Morning light breaks the eastern sky. Watch for the time is drawing nigh. What if it were today? Glory, 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 glory. Joy to my heart will be. Glory. to prepare the way. Glory, glory, Jesus will come someday and sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed he'll prepare when we all get to heaven when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing there will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory while we walk and while we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, God will shine aside. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We'll sing and shout the victory. Sing that last verse. And onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will be whole. Soon the pearly gates will open. When we all get to heaven, what a day rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory amen will you pray with me heavenly father you have given us the ability today to shout the victory that we have in Christ Jesus Lord, we give praise to you this day because you are holy. Lord, you are the one who sits upon the throne. Your divine, sovereign will is over all. Lord, and we give you thanks this day because of who you are. Lord, we give you thanks this day because of Christ Jesus. Lord, I ask this morning for wisdom as we continue to praise you as we open up your word. Father, may you guide us in our understanding of your word and our actions in this life. Lord, may you forgive us of our sins. God, as we give praise to you this day and thanks to you this day, we pray all this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Field Street Baptist Church. My name is Michael Pearson and I am the student minister here. And I'm so glad that you have decided to join us today. Whether you are online, in person, I just want to say welcome. And if you are a guest, we are especially delighted that you are here and if you are a guest, I would ask that you fill out a communication card that is seated in the pew back in front of you. Uh, fill that out and drop it off in one of the offertory boxes. We would love to get to know you. And also on the back of that card is a prayer card in which you can fill it out. And we would love to pray with you and pray for you. So the same, fill it out and drop it off in the offertory box. We would love to be praying with and for you. Well, good morning, and I would like to extend this greeting to everyone as we stand up and greet those around us.
Whosoever will may come. Let's sing that. Whosoever hear it, shout, shout the sound. Spread the blessed tidings all the world around. Tell the joyful news wherever man is found. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will, whosoever will. Send the proclamation over vale and hill. Tis a loving Father calls a wonders home. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever come but need not delay. Now the door is open. Enter while you may. Jesus is the truth, the only living way. Whosoever will, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation of hell and tis a loving Father, all the wanderer home. Whosoever will may come. Let's sing that last verse. Whosoever will, a promise is secure. Whosoever will forever must endure. Whosoever will, tis life forevermore. Whosoever will may, let's sing that chorus. Whosoever will, whosoever will. Hell and heal, tis a loving Father calls a wonder home. Whosoever will may come. You can be seated this morning. Have faith in God. What does that word say? When your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the ways you have tried. You know, he knows exactly where you are today. He sees you. He hasn't abandoned us, amen? He's here to meet your need, whatever that is. If we just put our faith and our trust in Him, let's sing that. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the ways you have trod. Never alone are the least of His children. Have faith in God, have faith, have faith in God, have faith in God, He's on His throne, have faith in God, He watches o'er His own, He cannot fail, He must prevail, have faith in God. Have faith in God when your prayers are unanswered. Your earnest plea, He will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust His word and be patient. Have faith in God, He'll answer yet. Have faith in God, He's on His throne. Have faith in God, He watches our His own. He cannot fail, He must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Let's sing that last verse. Have faith in God, though all else fell about you. Have faith in God, He provides for you. He cannot fail, though all kingdoms shall perish. He rules and reigns. Up on. Let's sing it. Have faith in God. We'll have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches our his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Amen. Thank you. 
What is the kingdom of God like? Jesus gives us a bit of an answer to that question in Luke's gospel, chapter 13, verses 18 through 21. Would you please open your copy of the word of God to Luke 13, verses 18 through 21. Now, before reading the sermon text this morning, I want to make a simple, urgent appeal to anyone present in this room and others who may be joining with us online, I want to make an urgent appeal to anyone who may not yet be a follower of Jesus Christ. Based on the authority of the Word of God, I urge you to repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All people have sinned according to the Scripture 
and have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And apart from a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, by faith, you have no hope for an eternity spent with God. Your sin, according to the Bible, separates you from God, makes you miserable, and condemns you before Him. I want to say, and I mean this with all due respect, but it is the absolute truth, your hope is not in Washington, D.C. Your hope is not in whoever occupies the Oval Office. Your hope is not on Wall Street. Your hope is not in the halls of Congress. Your hope is not in your financial resources. Your hope is not even in your good name and reputation. Your only hope of being reconciled to God is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because he is the only qualified mediator who may stand between the holy God of the universe, of holy scripture, and sinful man. He is the only one who can reconcile us to God. If you have not yet expressed a deep sorrow to God over your sins, sought his forgiveness, and cried out to him for rescue, then you must do this now. Please resist the temptation to put this off and presume on the mercy and grace and patience of God. Now is the time. The Bible makes clear that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father, we're so grateful for the declaration of Holy Scripture that whosoever may call upon your name shall be saved. For anyone present this morning in this very room or others who may be tuning in online, for anyone that does not have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ, may this very moment be that of salvation. None of us know how much time we have left. None of us know when you will return. So it's a dangerous game to play to presume that we have one more day or more time or to presume upon your mercy and grace and patience. Now is the appointed moment to be saved, to be made right with you through Jesus Christ. So for anyone that does not have a relationship with you, may they seek you out this morning, even foremost as you pursue them. I ask that your Holy Spirit will help us to see the truth that is tucked away in this text this morning, that we may get a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is like as we continue in our service to you here on earth for your glory. I ask that you would be with us now as we look to the scriptures, and it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Look with me in verse 18 and following. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and, and the birds of the sky nested in its branches. And again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three seta of flour until it was all leavened. What is the kingdom of God like? That is a great question, and it is a question that all of us should be asking ourselves frequently. After all, we as Christians are citizens of this kingdom, both here and now and in the eternal state. And it was a question for which Jesus was most prepared to answer because the central message of our Savior was the presence of the kingdom of God. Now, perhaps we should back up just a bit and ask another question. What is the kingdom of God? Well, it's, it's a bit complicated to answer that specific question, but let's give it a shot. Put simply, the kingdom of God is a kingdom which is 
ruled and will be ruled by Christ. You see, Christ is not just our Redeemer. We must also expand our thinking about Him to include that He is our sovereign King. The Bible tells us that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that He rules and reigns over a kingdom. Now, narrowly speaking, Christ reigns supreme over all things, but especially He reigns in the hearts of His people. Is this a future reign? Yes, but there is much more to it. Christ is King right this very minute. Now, if you don't hear even one more thing, (laughs) please hear what I just said. And you might do well to write it down. Christ is king right at this very minute. And I do not know about you, but I personally am thrilled at what I just shared with you. That King Christ is on his throne right at this very minute. The kingdom of God began when God himself as the incarnate Christ entered human history as man. Thus, when Scripture records the numerous times that Jesus stated that the kingdom of God had come near, what he was saying, in essence, was that the kingdom of God was near to them because he, the king of the kingdom, was there. When Jesus came to this earth, he inaugurated God's kingdom So in a very real sense, his kingdom is both present now and not yet fully realized. It's present with us, but it hasn't been fully realized just yet. And Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God quite frequently. In John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus said that his kingdom was, praise God, not of this world. In Matthew 4, 17, Jesus preached that repentance is necessary to be a part of the kingdom of God. What that means is you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you have repented of your sins. In John 3, Jesus taught that you must enter the kingdom of God by being born again. You must be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Your heart of stone must be replaced with a heart of flesh, and that can only be done by the saving work of the Holy Spirit, the regenerating work of God's Spirit. And in the text before us in Luke's Gospel, Jesus poses a key question in both verse 18 and verse 20. In verse 18, he asks the question, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? Then in verse 20, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? So in an effort to answer that question, Jesus vocalizes two parables. In verse 19, we have the parable of the mustard seed. And then in verse 21, the parable of leaven. So look again at verse 19. Jesus says, it is like a mustard seed. What is the kingdom of God like? It is like a mustard seed, get this, which a man took and threw into his own garden... And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the sky nested in its branches. So what does Jesus mean? It's interesting to note that this parable occurs in both Matthew and Mark, but here the emphasis is different. The emphasis here in Luke is on what the tiny mustard seed becomes. Now, as you may or may not know, a mustard seed is minuscule, tiny. It measures uh, between one and two two millimeters in diameter. Yet in proper conditions, a mustard seed can grow until it becomes a tree, and the mustard plant can reach 10 feet, sometimes even 15 feet. So in the fall of the year, the branches then become rigid, and birds of many kinds find a shelter from the storm, rest from weariness, and shade from the heat of the sun. And in this context, What is remarkable is that within 40 years of Christ's death, the gospel had reached all the great centers of the Roman world and many of the -the out-of-the-way places in addition to that. So one of the most crucial convictions that we hold sacred in the church is that God wants us to grow. God expects us 
to grow individually and certainly corporately. What does that mean? Well, it means in part that he wants us to reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. That means we want to reach more kids. We want to reach more students. We want to reach more adults. In fact, not only do we want to, we need to. We have to. We must. There are people all around us who need Christ. Everywhere we go, we are on mission with and for Jesus Christ. We have a mission field among our friends, among our relatives, our work associates, uh, our neighbors, and, and the, the friends of our kids. I can't say this emphatically enough. Everywhere you go, you are an ambassador for Christ. You are a minister of reconciliation. You represent the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're on mission. You live in a mission field. How do we do this? How do we go about engaging our, our world in which we live? Well, it starts, of course, in our living rooms. It then proceeds to the ball field. And on Tuesday, students return to the campuses of our community schools. It starts at the grocery store, in the workplace. You are on mission with and for Christ. You are part of the mustard seed that becomes a tree. We cannot stop growing. Why is that exactly? We talk about growth in the church, but why do we need to grow? Why must we, we grow? Well, I'll give you a couple of reasons. First of all, because God loves people. And, and no one loves people more than God. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why should we grow? Because God loves people. Secondly, because God commands us to reach out. There's nothing in Scripture that says once you're saved, sit and soak it up. It says... Go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have something to share. And it isn't just something, it's the good news of the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus saves wretches like us. We must grow because God commands us to reach out. Another reason that we are to grow is because this is the will of God. And God's will will take place. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. God wills that his church grows. So how can we go about reaching more people? Well, that's simple, at least from my point of view. It involves three actions. Number one, we pray. That's the most important work that any of us do. You do not have to have a special skill to pray. All of us can and should engage in prayer and we ask God to give us a burden for those around us who may not know Christ as Savior everywhere you look there are lost people and all around us we have a mission field and we ask God to help us see the fields as he sees them so that we're more attuned to his spirit so his spirit can lead us to engage people for Christ Secondly, we engage. You have to interact with people. You say, well, I don't like people. Well, you got to get over that a little bit because we have to build relationships with people. And we move the conversations of life to the matters of the spiritual. And you and I must view the relationships of our lives as fields of souls that need work, gardening. I know there's a lot of folks in this room this morning that like to garden. I don't happen to be one of them, but I like other things about yard work, just not the gardening part. But the metaphor really works in my mind for me in that you tend to the relationships God has put in your life like a gardener working the garden. And you stay at it, and you keep working it, and you water and you plant and you harvest, and you do all those things that a gardener does. And we engage, and we work the field of souls where God has placed us. Third, we must invite. I can't stress this enough. You do not know 
you may never know this side of glory, how a text message, an email, a phone call, or even a spontaneous strategic conversation face-to-face -face can redirect the trajectory of someone's life. You don't know how God might use something so simple to change someone. I'll give you a personal example if you can bear it for a moment. The year was 1985. I had just graduated from Dumas High School. I was college bound. I was called to preach and I was eager to earn an education. Now earlier in the year in 85, I had visited the campus of Hardin-Simmons University, but I actually thought I was headed to Baylor. However, what seemed like a random phone call on a weekday evening from a lady by the name of Elizabeth Longbotham, a recruiter from Hardin-Simmons University radically changed my life. And all she really said, as I remember it, was, John, we really want you to come to Hardin-Simmons University. That was it. And God used a phone call from this lady to direct my steps to HSU. And God marked my life so significantly during my time as a student there. I discovered Hardin Simmons, Pioneer Drive Baptist Church, was received into the intern program at PDBC, came under the mentoring and tutelage of one of the dearest friends I've ever had, Dr. Jack Riddle Hoover, and was received by a church in a remarkable way. It was the providence of God that was set into motion by an invitation. And most likely, I was just a name on this recruiter's list of prospective students that she was asked to contact. She had no idea what God was going to do as a result of a simple invitation. You just don't know how an invitation extended from you to someone else may be used in the hand of a sovereign God to change a life. So we pray, we engage, we invite, and we watch what God will do with these simple actions to grow his church, his kingdom. Now, I would argue that there's no blessing in this life like knowing Christ as Savior and belonging in the kingdom of God. And I will just go on and say it because it's true. Life is not worth much without Jesus Christ. We must tell people about Jesus both with our words and by our actions. One prayer at a time, one day at a time, one counter at a time, one relationship at a time. And it all starts very small. And you just keep at it. And the reality is that much of God's work begins very small and ends up being quite impactful. And it is God who is the one who determines that. We don't get to determine that. But we cast our mustard seed into his garden. And let him work it as he sees fit and as it pleases him. Now, let's take a look at the parable of the leaven in verse 21. Jesus says, It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three seta of flour until it was all leavened. Now, I didn't know this until I did a little research on it. So forgive me, those of you who are way advanced in what leaven is, way above my knowledge of this, but leaven is a substance. Evidently, it's typically yeast that is used in dough to make it rise. It, it, it has a pervasive influence which modifies, and I like this, or transforms it for the better. So one could argue that the mustard seed represents the external observable growth of the kingdom whereas the leaven represents the internal development of the kingdom. Yet, to throw a monkey in the wrench, <laughs> what if these parables are a warning about the spread of evil in the world? What if Jesus is teaching something that is truly undesirable? Is that possible? Now, virtually anyone can see plainly that evil can spread through a culture, through a society, through a nation like leaven within flour. The advance of evil starts often small and then has dramatic 
consequences and detriment. Evil spreads, corruption increases, love grows cold, morals wane, right and wrong becomes relative, truth is negotiable. Repeat a lie long enough and people begin to believe it. And then good people go silent. Evil people go vocal and violent. My question would be, are we not seeing such a dynamic in the modern United States of America? Is there any realm of our nation's infrastructure where there is not partial or even wholesale corruption? It is high time that the people of God must commit to acting like the people of God. Why is that? Because we are kingdom people. What is the kingdom of God like? Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and it is like leaven. So my final question for you this morning is, are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? And have you given your life to Jesus Christ? And if you have not, why not? And if you have... Are you committed to being a kingdom citizen? It's interesting that we, pardon me, as Christians and as citizens of the United States, we have a dual citizenship, meaning simply what I just said. You're a citizen here in the U.S., but you're also a citizen of the kingdom of God, and your kingdom citizenship trumps your U.S. citizenship, but you're both simultaneously, and we live and serve a great king who has a kingdom purpose and agenda for us to to be putting into effect for his glory what is the kingdom of god like it is like a mustard seed and it is like leaven may god use us for his glory to spread the good news of jesus christ that more may come to know the savior as we have would you bow your heads with me please Heavenly Father, thank you for your sovereignty over all things. Thank you for what you have shown us this morning in Scripture of what the kingdom of God is like. And I pray, Father, that we would be useful in your hand to make Christ known among the nations, starting right here in our own community in our living rooms, in the classrooms, in the house of worship, wherever it is we go, please help us to be mindful of the reality that we are on mission with and for you. We pray, God, that you'll help us to have a fresh set of eyes and a fresh set of ears to see and hear what is right in front of us. And, Father, that we would be attuned to your Holy Spirit to guide us, to give us the words, to give us the opportunities, to even help us overcome our own um, shyness, to share the good news with those who still need to respond to you. I pray, Father, that you will rekindle this in our hearts for your glory and for the sake of so many who still need to call upon your name in repentance and faith. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment, I'll ask you to stand to your feet. I'll stand here at the front this morning, eager to receive anyone that may come making a decision public today. Uh, I would urge you, if you've not done so, to ask Jesus into your life to be your Savior, to forgive you of your sins, and by faith, receive Him and follow Him faithfully. Many of you, I know you're already followers of Jesus Christ, so perhaps there's someone on your heart this morning you would want to put before God, asking Him to give you the opportunity, perhaps, or put someone in their path who would move the conversations of life to matters of the eternal. I know that's a prayer God would hear and honor in your life. Maybe you have something else you want to put before Him, some other decision, commitment you want to make before Him today. I urge you, of course, to do that. Would you please stand to your feet as we have this time of invitation. You come as we sing together. Change in my life has been one.
Well, it's wonderful to see you this morning, and I mean, I can see you better than I've ever seen you before. These lights are like high definition, and some of you, that really did a favor, and others, <laughs> just leave it at that. Let me remind you that tonight at 6 o'clock, if you have an interest in joining us, we will convene at the Splash Station. We have secured that facility for an all-church fellowship. We're going to serve pizza at 6 o'clock in the gazebo that's right next to the uh, facility and then at 6 30 we have access into splash station please plan to come if you would like and bring a guest for sure we look forward to a great time together also please be in prayer for our cisd community as students return to campuses on tuesday uh, we certainly want to pray for our cleburne isd personnel I'm so thankful for all of them and uh, for the task to which they have been called and just ask the Lord to uh, bless them as students return back to school this week. A lot going on in our church and certainly in our community. And we need God's guidance and grace. And uh, thank you in advance for all your prayerfulness. Let's pray together as we dismiss. Lord, we just thank you that we can be in your house today. What a joy it is to gather in this place to worship you. To gather around the scriptures and to be challenged be kingdom people and kingdom minded especially this morning we ask you to be with those who give leadership to the school district in whatever capacity father we're so thankful for all of our cisd personnel and ask your blessing upon our campuses as students return this week pray it'll be a great academic year keep our campuses safe bless our teachers lord thank you for all their hard work and especially we pray for those that since a calling from you uh, to be your presence in the classroom among boys and girls. We just uh, thank you for the great privilege that is to represent you and know it's a tough task and pray you'll be with all who serve in our school district. We're grateful, Lord, for your love for us through Christ. And pray that that will shine through in our lives and that you will be glorified. Guide us now as we depart to our Bible study classes. Thank you again for the time we've had together in worship this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.